The wind howled when it rose, but aside from that, quietly heavy on the land, the soft creak of the axle sounded loud by comparison. No birds sang in the forest, no squirrels chittered from a branch. Not that he expected them, really. Not this spring. Only trees that kept leaf or needle through the winter had any green about them. Snarls of last year's brambles spread any green about them. Brown webs over stone outer crops under the trees. Nettles numbered um, most among the few weeds. The rest were the sorts of sharp spurs or thorns or stinkweed, which left a rank smell on the unwary boot that crushed it. Scattered white patches of snow still dotted the ground, where tight clumps of trees kept in deep shade. <clears throat> where sunlight did reach, it held neither strength nor warmth. The pale sun sat above the trees to the east, but its light was crispy dark, as if it mixed with shadows. It was an awkward morning made for unpleasant thoughts. Without thinking, he touched the knock of the arrow. It was ready to draw to his cheek. A one smooth movement, the way Tame had taught him. Winter had been bad enough on the farms, worse than even the oldest folk remembered. But it must have been harsher still in the mountains. If the number of wolves driven down into two rivers was any guide, wolves raided the sheep pens, chewed their way into barns to get to the cattle and horses. Bears had been after the sheep, too. Where a bear had not been seen in years, it was no longer safe to be out after dark. Men were the prey as often as sheep, and the sun <coughs> did not always have to be down. Tam was taking steady strides to on the other side of the bella, using his spear as a walking staff, ignoring the wind that made his brown cloak flapper like a banner. Now and again he touched the mare's flank lightly, to remind her to keep moving. With his thick chest and broad face, he was a pillar of reality in that morning, like a stone in the middle of the drifting dream. His sun-roughened cheeks might be lined, and his hair have only a sprinkling of black among the gray, but there was a solidness to him. As though a flood could wash around him without uprooting his feet, he stumped down the road now impassively. Wolves' bears were all very well, his manner said, things that any man who kept sheep must be aware of. But they had not been trying to stop Tim Althor getting to Edmund's rest. With a guilty start, Rand returned to watching his side of the road, Tam's matter-of-factness reminding him of his task. He was a head taller than his father, taller than anyone else in the district, and had a little of Tam in him physically, except perhaps for a breadth of shoulder, gray eyes, and the reddish tinge to his hair came from his mother, so Tam said. She had been an outlander, and Rand remembered little of her aside from a smiling face though he did put flowers on her grave every year at bell time, in the spring and in the Sunday in the sun. summer. Go on. Two small casks of Tan's apple brandy rested in the lurching cart, and the eighth larger barrels of apple cider, only slightly hard after a winter's curing. Tam delivered the same every year to Wine Spring Inn for use during bell time. and he had declared that it would take more than wolves or a cold to stop him this spring. Even so, they had not been been to the village for weeks. Not even Tam traveled much these days, but Tam had given his word about the brandy and cider, even if he had waited to make delivery until the day before festival. Keeping his word was important to Tam. Rand was just glad to get away from the farm, almost as glad as about the coming of the bell time. As Rand watched his side of the road, the feeling grew in him that he was being watched. For a while, he tried to shrug it off. Nothing moved or made a sound among the trees except the wind. But the feeling not only persisted, it grew stronger. The hairs on his arms stirred. His skin prickled as if it itched on the inside. He shifted his bow irritably to rub it at his arms and told himself to stop letting fancies take him. There was nothing in the woods on his side of the road, and Tam would have spot spoken if there was had been anything on the other side. He glanced over his shoulder and blinked. Now more than twenty spans back down the road, a cloaked figure on a horseback followed them. A horse and a rider alike, black, dull, and gleaming. It was more habit than anything else that kept him walking backward alongside the cart while he looked. 
The rider's cloak covered him to the boot tops. The cowl tugged well forward, so no part of him showed. Vaguely, Ran thought there was something odd about the horseman. But it was shadowed by the opening hood that fascinated him. He could only see the vaguest outlines of a face. But he had the feeling he was looking right into the rider's eyes, as he could not look away. Queasiness settled in his stomach. There was only shadow to see in the hood, but he felt hatred, as sharply as if he could have snarling face, hatred for everything that lived, hatred for him most of all, for him above all things. One second, Luke, or James. Have you showed these to Lucas? I don't know if he would like it or not, probably not. Oscar's being a pain in the butt. Abruptly, a stone caught his heel, and he stumbled, breaking his eyes away from the dark horseman. His bow dropped, bow dropped to the road, and only an outthrust hand grabbing Bella's harness saved him from falling flat on his back. With a startled snort, the mare stopped, twisting her head to see what had caught her. Tam frowned over Bella's back at him. Are you all right, lad? A rider, Rand said breathlessly, pulling himself upright, a stranger following us. Where the older man lifted his broad blade spear and peered back warily. There, down the Rand's word trailed off as he turned to point. The road behind was empty, disbelieving he stared into the forest on both sides. Bare branched trees offered no hiding place, but there was not a glimmer of a horse or horseman. He met his father's questioning gaze. He was there. A man in a black cloak and a black horse. I wouldn't doubt your word, lad, but where has he gone? I don't know, but he was there. He snatched up the fallen bow and arrow, hastily checked fletching before re-knocking, and half drew before letting the bowstring relax. There was nothing to aim at. He was... <coughs> Tam shook his grizzled head. If you say so, lad, come on. Then a horse leaves hoof prints, even on this ground. He started toward the rear of the cart, his cloak wicking in the wind. If we find them... We'll know for a fact he was there. If not, well, these are days to make a man think he's seeing things. Abruptly, Rand realized what had been odd about the horseman, aside from him being there at all. The wind that beat the tam in him, not so much as shifted a fold of black cloak. His mouth was suddenly dry. He must have imagined it. His father is right. This was a morning to prickle a man's imagination, but he did not believe it. Only how did he tell his father that a man who had appeared, apparently vanished into air, wore a cloak the wind did not touch? With a worried frown, he peered into the woods around them. It looked different than it ever had before. Almost since he was old enough to walk, he had run loose in the forest, the ponds, the streams of water wood beyond the last arms east of Edmonds Field, were there, where he had learned to swim. He had explored into the sand hills which many in the two rivers said it was bad luck. And once he had even gone into the very foot of the mountains of the mist, him and his closest friends, Matt Cawthon and Perrin Ebaira. That was a lot further afield than most people in Edmonds Field ever... You need to move, Asker. That was a lot further afield than most of Edmonds Field ever went. To them, a journey to the next village up a watch hill or down to Devon Ride was a big event. Nowhere in all of that had they found a place that made him afraid. Today, though, the Westwood was not the place he remembered. A man who could disappear so suddenly could reappear just as suddenly, maybe even right beside them. No, father, there's no need. When Tam stopped in surprise, Bran covered his flush by tugging at his hood, his cloak. You're probably right. No point in looking for what isn't there. Not when we can use the time getting on to the village and out of this wind. I could do with a pipe, Tam said slowly, in a mug of ale where it's warm. Rapidly he gave a broad grin, and I expect you're eager to see Egwin. Ray managed a weak smile. Of all things he might want to think about right then, the mayor's daughter was far down the list. He did not need any more confusion. For the past year she had been making him increasingly jittery whenever they were together. Worse, she did not even seem to be aware of it. No, he certainly didn't want to add Edwin to his thoughts. He was hoping his father had not noticed he was afraid when Tam said, Remember the flame lad in the void. 
It was an odd thing Tam had taught him. Concentrate on a single flame, feed all your passions into it. Fear, hate, anger, until your mind became empty. Become one with the flame, the void, Tam said, and could do anything. Nobody else in Edmund's field talked that way, but Tam won the archery competition at Beltine every year with his flame in his void. Rand thought he might have a chance at placing this year himself if he could manage to hold on to the void. For Tam to bring it up now meant he had noticed, but he had said nothing more about it. Tam clucked Bella into motion once more, and they resummoned their journey, the older man striding along as if nothing untoward had happened, and nothing untoward could. Rand wished he could Im imitate him. He tried forming the emptiness in his mind. But it kept slipping away into images of the black-cloaked horseman. He wanted to believe what Tam, that Tam was right, and that the rider had just been his imagination. But he could remember that feeling of hatred too well. There had been someone, and that someone had meant him harm. He did not stop looking back until high peak thatched roofs of Edmund's field surrounded him. But the village lay close on to Westwood, and the forest gradually thinned until the last few trees stood actually among the stout frame houses. The land sloped gently down to the east, though not without patches of woods, farms and hedges, bordered fields and pastures, quilted land beyond the village, and all the way to Waterwood and its tangle of streams and ponds. The land to the west was just as fertile, and the pastures there lush in most years, but only a handful of farms could be found in the Westwood. Even those few dwindled to none miles short of sand hills, not to mention the mountains of mist, which rose above the Westwood treetops, distant but in plain sight from Edmund's field. Some said that the land was too rocky, as if there were not rocks everywhere in the two rivers, and others said it was hard luck land. A few muttered that there was no point in getting any closer to the mountains than need to be. Whatever the reasons, only the hardiest men farmed in the Westwood. Small children and dogs dodged around the cart in whooping swarms. Once it passed the first row of houses, Bella plodded patiently, ignoring the yelling youngsters who tumbled under her nose, playing tag and rolling hoops. In the last month, there had been little play and laughter from the children even when the weather had slackened enough enough to let the children out. Fear of wolves kept them in. It seemed the approach of Beltine had caught them, taught them how to play again. The festival had affected the adults as well. Broad shutters were thrown back, and almost every house in the good wife stood in a window, apron tied about her long braided hair, done up in a kerchief, shaking sheets and hanging mattresses over the window sills. Whether or not leaves had appeared in the trees, no woman would let Beltine come before her spring cleaning was done. In every yard, ru yard rugs hung in stretch lines, and the children, who had not been quick enough to run free in the streets, instead vented their frustration on the carpets with wicker beaters. On roof after roof, the go good men of the house clamored about checking the thatch to see the winner's damage meant calling on the old Senbu the Thatcher. Several times Tam paused to engage one man or another in brief conversation. Since he and Rand had not been off the farm for weeks, everyone wanted to walk, catch up on how things were out that way. Few Westwood men had been in. Tam spoke of damage from winter storms, each one worse than the one before, and stillborn lambs and brown fields where crops should be sprouting and pastures graining of, of ravens flocking in where songbirds had come in years before. Grim talk with preparations for bell time going on all around them, and much shaking of heads. It was all the same on all sides. Most of the men rolled their shoulders and said, Well, we'll survive the light we'll survive the light willing. Some grinned and added, And if the light doesn't will, we will survive. That was the way of most people in two rivers. 
People who had to watch the hail beat the crops or the wolves take their lambs and start over, no matter how many years it happened, did not give up easily. Most of those who did not were long since gone. Tam would not have stopped for Whit Conger. The man had not come out into the street, so they had to halt or let Bella run over him. The Congers and the Congers, the two families, were so intermarried, no one really knew where one family let off and the other began. We're known from Watch Hill to Devon Run and maybe as far as Terran Ferry. As complainers and troublemakers, I have to get this Bryn Elvery wit, Tam said, nodding to the barrels in the cart. But the scrawny man held his ground with a sour expression on his face. He had been sprawled out on his front steps, not up on his roof, though the thatch looked as badly needed Master Bue's attention. He never seemed ready to start or to finish what he had started the first time. Most of the Coplins and Congers were like that, those who were not worse. What are we going to do about the Navi, Althor, Conger demanded. We haven't... We can't have a wisdom like that for Edmund's field. Tam sighed heavily. It's not our place, with The wisdom is woman's business. Well, we'd better do something, Althor. She said we'd have a mild winter and a good harvest. Now you ask her what she hears on the wind, and she just scowls, and you stomp up, and stomps off. If you've asked her the way you usually do, Whit Tam said patiently, you're lucky she didn't thump you with that stick she carries. Now, if you don't mind this brandy, Naveen Elmera is just too young to be a wisdom. Althor, if the women's circle won't do something, then the village council has to. What business of yours is the wisdom, Wit Conger? roared a woman's voice. Wit flinched as his wife marched out of the house. Days Conger was twice as wide as Wit, a hard faced woman with an ounce of fat on her. She glared at him with her fists and on her hips. Try meddling in women's circle business and see how you like eating your own cooking, which you won't do in my kitchen, and washing your own clothes and making your own bed, which won't be under my roof. But days, Wit, um, I was just... If you'll pardon me, days, Tam said. Wit, the light at shine on you both. He got Bella moving again, leading her around the scrawny fellow. Days was concentrating on her husband now, but any minute she could realize whom it was Whit had been talking to. That was why they had not accepted any of the invitations to stop for a bite to eat or something hot to drink. When they saw Tam, the good wives at Edmunds Field went on point. Like hounds spotting rabbit, there was not one of them who did not know just the perfect wife for a widower with a good farm, even if it was Westwood. Rand stepped along just as quickly as Tam, perhaps even more so. He was sometimes cornered when Tam was not around, with no way to escape outside the rudeness. Herded onto a stool by the kitchen fire, he would be fed pastries or honeysuckles or meat pies, and always the good wife's eyes weighed and measured him as neatly as any merchant scales and tapes while she told him that what he was eating was not nearly so good as her widowed sister's cooking or her next to eldest cousin. Tam's was certainly not getting any younger, she would say. It was good that he had loved his wife so. It boded well for the next woman in his life. But he had mourned long enough. Tam needed a good woman. It was a simple fact, she would say, or something very close, that a man just could not do without a woman to take care of him and keep him out of trouble. Worst of all were those who paused thoughtfully at about the point, and then asked with elaborate casualness exactly how old he was now. Like most of Two Rivers folk, Rand had a strong, stubborn streak. Outsiders sometimes said it was prime trade of people in the Two Rivers that could give moles lessons and teach stones. The good wives were fine and kindly women for the most part, but he hated being pushed into anything, and they made him feel as if they were prodding with sticks. So he walked fast and wished Tam would hurry Bella along. Soon the streets opened onto the green in a broad expanse in the middle of the village, usually covered with thick grass. The green this spring showed only a few fresh patches among the yellowish brown and dead grass and the black of bare earth. A double handful of geese waddled about, beadly eyed in the ground, but not finding anything worth pecking, and someone had tethered a milk cow to crop the sparse growth. Toward the west end of the green, in the winter sp wine spring, itself gushed a low stone outcrop in a flow that never failed. It flowed strong enough to knock a man down, 
and sweet enough to justify its name a dozen times over. From the spring that had rapidly widened wine spring, water ran swiftly off the east, willows dotting its banks all the way to Master Thane's Mill and beyond, until it split into dozens of streams. In the swampy depths of the waterwood, too low, railed footbridges across the clear stream and in the green, and one bridge wider than the others, stout enough to bear. Wagons. The wagon bridge marked where the north road coming down from the Terran Ferry and Watch Hill became the old road, leading it divine ride. Outsiders sometimes found it funny that the road had one name to the north and another to the south, but that's the way it was. It had always been, as far as anyone in Edmonds Field knew, and that was that. It was good enough reason for Two Rivers people. On the far side of the bridges, the mounds were already building for the Beltines fires. Three careful stacks of logs, almost as big as houses. They had been cleared dirt, of course, not on the green, even sparse as it was. What a festival would not take place around fires would happen on the green. Near the wine spring, a score of older women sing softly as they erected the spring pole. Shorn of its branches, the straight, slender trunk of a fir tree stood ten feet high even in the hole they had dug for it, and not a girl's too young to wear their hair braided, sat cross-legged and watched enviously, occasionally singing snatches of the song the woman sang. Tam plucked at Bella as if to make her speed up her pace, though she ignored it, and ran studiously kept his eyes from the woman what they were doing. In the morning, the men would pretend to be surprised to find the pole, then at noon, the unmarried woman would dance the pole, entwining it with long colored ribbons, while the unmarried man sang. No one knew when the custom began or why. It was another thing that was the way it had always been, but it was an excuse to sing and dance, and nobody in Two Rivers needed much excuse for that. The whole day at Beltine would take up with singing and dancing and feasting, with time of foot traces and contests and almost everything. Prizes would be given not only in archery but for the best with the sling and the quarterstaff. There would be contests at solving riddles and puzzles at the rope tug and lifting and tossing weights. Prizes for the best singer, the best dancer, the best fiddle player, and for the quickest to share a sheep. Even the best at the bowls and the ar at darts. Bell time was supposed to come when spring had well and truly arrived. The first lambs born and the first crop up. Even with the old cold hanging on, though, no one had any idea of putting it off. Everyone could use a little singing and dancing, and to top everything, if the rumors could be believed, a grand display of fireworks was planned for the green. If the first peddler of the year appeared in time, of course. That had been causing considerable talk. It was ten years since the last such display, and that was still talked about. The wine spring inn stood at the east end of the green, Hard beside the wagon bridge, the first floor of the inn was the river rock. Though the foundation was of older stone, some said came from the mountains. The whitewashed second store where the Brandylin Alvera, the innkeeper and mayor of Edmondsfield, for the first for the past twenty years lived in the back with his wife and daughters, jutted out over the lower floor of all the way around, red roof tile, and only such roof in the village, glittered in the weak sunlight, and smoke drifted from three of the inn's dozen tall chimneys. At the south end of the inn, away from the stream, stretched the remains of a much larger stone foundation, once part of the inn, or so it was said. A huge oak tree grew in the middle of it now, with a bull thirty paces around, and spreading branches as thick as a man. In the summer, Bran Alvaire set tables and benches under those branches, shady with leaves then, where the people could enjoy a cup of cooling breeze while they talked or perhaps set out board for games of stones. Here we are, lad, Tam reached for Bella's harness, but she stopped in front of the inn before his hand touched the leather. Knows the way better than I do, he chuckled, and the last creak of the axle faded. Bran Alvera appeared from the inn, seeming as always to step too lightly for a man of his girth nearly double that of anyone else in the village. A smile split his round face, which was topped by a sparse fringe of gray hair. The innkeeper was in his shirt sleeves, despite the chill, with a spotless white apron wrapped around him. 
a silver medallion in the form of a set of balance scales hung on his chest. The medallion, along with the full-size set of scales used to weigh the coins of the merchants who came down barreling for or to back, it was a symbol of the mayor's office. Bran only wore it for dealing with the merchants and on fest festival feast days and weddings. He had it on a day early now, but that might that night was the winter night, the night before bell time, when everyone would visit back and forth almost the whole night long, exchanging small gifts, having a bite to eat and touch and drink at every house. After the winter, Ran thought he probably considered winter night excuse enough not to wait until tomorrow. Tam, the mayor shouted as he hurried toward them. The light shined on me. It's good to see you at last. And you, Rand, how are you, my boy? Fine, Master Alvare, Rand said. And you, sir? But Bran's attention was already back on Tam. I was almost beginning to think you wouldn't be bringing the brandy this year. You've never waited so late before. I've no liking for leaving the farm these days, Bran, Tam replied. Not with the wolves the way they are in the weather. Bran harumph. I could. I wish somebody wanted to talk about something besides the weather. Everyone complains about it, and folk who know better expect me to say it right. I've just spent twenty minutes explaining to Mistress Adam that I can do nothing about the storks, though she expected me to do. He shook his head. An ill omen, a scratchy voice announced, No storks nesting on the rooftops at Beltine. Send view as gnarled and dark as an old root marched up to Tam and Bran and just leaned on his walking staff. Near as tall as he was and just leaned into his walk, just as gnarled. He tried to fix both men at once with his beadly eyes. There's worse to come, you mark my words. Have you become a soothsayer? Interpreting omens, Tam asked dryly, or do you listen to the wind like wisdom? There's certainly enough of it, some originating not far from here. Mock if you will, Sen muttered, but if it doesn't warm enough for crops to sprout soon, more than one root cellar will come up empty before the harvest. By next winter there may be nothing left alive in two rivers but wolves and ravens. If it is next winter at all, maybe it will be still this winter. Now, what is that supposed to mean? Bran said sharply. Sen gave a sour look. I've not much good to say about Naveen Marivere. You know that. For one thing, she's too young, no matter. The woman's circle seems to object to the village council, even talking about their business, though they interfere in ours whenever they want, to which is most of the time, or so it seems. Son, Tam broke in, is there a point to this? This is the point, Althor. Ask the wisdom when the winter will end, and she walks away. Maybe she doesn't want to tell us what she hears on the wind. Maybe what she hears is that the winter won't end. Maybe it's just going to go on being winter until the wheel turns and the age ends. There's your point. Maybe sheep will fly, Tam reported, and Bran threw up his hands. The light protect me from fools. You sitting on the village council, son, and now you're spreading the Copeland talk? Well, you listen to me. We have enough problems without. A quick tug at Rand's sleeve and a voice pitched low from his ear distracted him from the older men. Let's talk. Come on, Rand, while they're arguing before they put you to work. Rand glanced down and had to grin. Matt Cathoon crouched beside his cart so Tam and Bran and Sen could not see him. His wiry body contorted like a stork trying to bend itself double. Matt's brown eyes twinkled with mischief as usual. Dave and I caught a big old badger, all grouchy at being pulled out of his den. We're going to let it loose on the green and watch the girls run. Rand's smile broadened. It did not sound as much like fun to him as it would have a year or two back. But Matt never seemed to grow up. He took a quick look at his father. The men had their heads together, still all three talking at once, then lowered his own voice. I promise to unload the cider. I can meet you later, though. Matt rolled his eyes skyward, totting barrels. Burn me. I'd rather play stones with my baby sister. Well, I know of better things than a badger. We had strangers in two rivers last evening. For an instant, Rand stopped breathing. A man on a horseback, he asked intently. A man in a black cloak on a horseback? And his cloak doesn't move in the wind? Matt swallowed his grin and his voice dropped to an even hoarser whisper. You saw him too? I thought I was the only one. Don't laugh, Rand, but he scared me. 
I'm not laughing. He scared me, too. I could swear he hated me. He wanted to kill me. Rand shivered. Until that day, he had never thought anyone wanted to kill him, really wanting to kill him. That sort of thing just did not happen in Two Rivers. A fist fight, maybe, or a wrestling match, but not killing. I don't know about hating Rand, but he was scary enough, anyway. All he did was sit on his horse, looking at me, just outside the village. I've never been so frightened in my life. Well, I looked away for just a moment. It wasn't easy, mind you. And then when I looked back, he vanished. Blood and ashes. Three days it's been. I can hardly stop thinking about him. I keep looking over my shoulder. Matt attempted a laugh that came out as a croak. Funny now being scared takes you. You think strange things? I actually thought just for a minute. Mind, it might be the dark one. He tried to laugh, but no sound came out at all this time. Rand took a deep breath. As much to remind himself for any other reason, he said to Rope, The dark one and all the forsaken are bound in Shalgul, beyond the great blight, bound by the creator of the moment, creation, and bound until the end of time. The hand of the creator shelters the world, and the light shines on all of us. He drew another breath and went on. Besides, if he was free, what would the shepherd of the night be doing in two rivers, watching farm boys? I don't know. But I do know that the rider was evil. Don't laugh. I'll take an oath on it. Maybe it was the dragon. You're just full of cheerful thoughts, aren't you, Rain? muttered. And you sound worse than sin. My mother always said the forsaken would come for me if I didn't mind, mend my ways. If I ever saw anybody who looked like Ishmael or Agnar, it was him. Everybody's mother scared them with the forsaken, Rain said dryly. But most grew out of it. Why not the shadow man? while you're about it. Matt glared at him. I haven't been so scared since. No, I've never been that scared, and I don't mind admitting it. Me either. My father thinks I was jumping at shadows under the trees. Matt nodded glumly and leaned back against the cartwheel. So does my dad. I told Dave and Elm and Daughtry they've been watching like hawks ever since, but they haven't seen anything. Nal M thinks I was trying to trick him. Dave thinks he's down from Terran Ferry a sheep stealer or a chicken thief. A chicken thief? He lapsed into a affronted silence. It's probably all foolishness anyways, Rand said finally. Maybe he's just a sheep stealer. He tried to picture it, but it was like picturing a wolf taking the cat's place in front of a mouse hole. Well, I didn't like the way he looked at me, and neither did you. Not if how you jumped at me is any guide. We ought to tell someone. We already have. Matt, both of us, and we were believed. Can you imagine trying to convince Master of the Air about this fellow without him seeing him? He sent us off to Naveen to see if we were sick. There are two of us now. Nobody could believe we both imagined it. Rand rubbed the top of his head briskly, wondering what to say. Matt was something of a by word around the village. Few people had escaped his pranks, and now his name came up whenever a wash line dropped laundry dirt or a loose saddle deposited a farmer on the road. Matt did not even have to be anywhere around. His support might be worse than none.